Infection rates are going up, hospitalizations are going up, deaths are going up. President-elect Joe Biden lays out the grim reality of the COVID challenge ahead. As nearly a quarter of a million Americans have lost their lives to the virus, he used the first day of his transition government to announce a new COVID task force. Wear a mask. And to make this plea to all. I won't be president until January 20th, but my message today is to everyone. It doesn't matter your party, your point of view. We can save tens of thousands of lives if everyone would just wear a mask for the next few months. Not Democrat or Republican lives, American lives. If only the Trump administration gave the same advice. Not a single person wearing a mask inside the White House at 2 a.m. on Wednesday morning when the president emerged to declare prematurely that he'd won the election. Now two of his most senior officials, last week Chief of Staff Mark Meadows and today Ben Carson, both present that night, have tested positive for COVID-19. If you're just waking up, markets are reacting to news that Pfizer's COVID-19. Today, global stock markets cast virus gloom aside and instead soared on the news from the drug maker Pfizer that its COVID-19 vaccine had been proven in tests to be 90% effective. Donald Trump tweeted it was such great news, while Vice President Mike Pence tried to claim credit on the president's behalf, saying the discovery was thanks to the public-private partnership forged by President Trump. But Pfizer responded that it had not been part of the scheme and hadn't received any money from the US government for its research. Donald Trump was tweeting from inside the White House, where he still holed up and insisting that he won the election. He was briefly seen yesterday as he returned from a second day golfing and is reportedly planning to hold campaign-style rallies to drum up support in states where he believes a recount will declare him the victor. Meanwhile, the woman who runs the agency in charge of presidential transitions, a Trump appointee, was digging in too, so far refusing to sign the letter, allowing president-elect Joe Biden's team to formally begin its work. How could she when the president's son is tweeting videos like these? All Trump. You gotta do what you gotta do. That purport to show Trump ballots being deliberately set fire to. Got around 80. There's no proof that really happened, nor any proof, officials say, that voter fraud took place at all. But Donald Trump doesn't want to listen to them, nor acknowledge the fact he's yesterday's man, who needs to move over now and make room on the shelf for someone new. And Siobhan is with me now here. Um, Siobhan, what's the significance then of the termination of Secretary of Defence Esper? Well, Matt, this is all about revenge. Remember, Mark Esper was the man who stood alongside Donald Trump here the day he held that Bible for that photo right opportunity here, yeah. right here when police had come earlier and removed Black Lives uh, Matter protesters from here forcibly using tear gas. The president then later said that he would use military force if he needed to on demonstrators. And it was Mark Esper who told the president that he didn't agree with that move. Uh, hence, probably as part of a settling of scores, he's gone today. It is unprecedented nonetheless to remove your security chief during a delicate transition period such as this. Uh, Donald Trump, though, may have been aware that Mark Esper had already written his resignation letter and wanted to get in there first in true Trump style with that classic tweet that you said earlier, Mark Esper has been terminated. It could also be that Mark Esper was part of a growing band of inner Trump circle members who are increasingly looking to the president and saying, no, sir, it is you who has been terminated. And now you need to leave that White House. Siobhan, thank you very much indeed. Well, um, it sounds a little bit more like the end of Rome than the run up to Christmas. But let me just show you this picture of the Christmas tree on the south side of the White House, the baubles being hung. This is a very big moment in the kind of you know, ritual of the nation every year. But frankly, I think this year what the Trumps are contemplating in there is not so much a festive season, but Narnia, winter without Christmas, frankly. Now, as congratulations to Joe Biden flooded in from around the world, there were exceptions. Russia, China and indeed Turkey are yet to recognize the election result. From rejoining the Iran nuclear deal to dealing with nuclear armed North Korea, the president-elect has his work cut out. As our foreign affairs correspondent, Jonathan Rugman, now reports.
One of Washington's greatest architectural quirks is the statue of Benjamin Franklin outside the Trump International Hotel. America's first diplomat in the 1770s juxtaposed with today's diplomatic wrecking ball. By contrast, Joe Biden, who is Franklin's fellow Pennsylvanian, sat on the Senate's Foreign Relations Committee for 30 years. Tonight, the whole world is watching America. And I believe at our best, America is a beacon for the globe. We will not lead, we will lead not only by the example of our power, but by the power of our example. His greatest long-term challenge is China. Once friendly with President Xi, Biden recently called him a thug. From Hong Kong to the South China Sea to Trump's tariffs, the relationship is at its worst in decades. Is that something that Joe Biden is going to have to follow through on in a similar vein? I have no doubt that the president-elect will stand up to China. The difference here is that uh, President Trump had a tactic, but he had no strategy. Those tariffs hurt the American people, hurt the American farmers, as much as they might have put a penalty on China. The biggest military threat is North Korea. Three rounds of Trump's fruitless talks with Kim Jong-un have rendered him no less dangerous. And last month, the dictator's new and biggest ever intercontinental ballistic missile went on display. Another despot, Vladimir Putin, still hasn't acknowledged Joe Biden's victory. Today, talking to Bashar al-Assad, Syria's blood-stained tyrant. Expect a tougher diplomatic line from Biden on both. European leaders see him as a partner for combating climate change and COVID together. But Biden, like Trump, will want Europe to fund more of NATO, while the EU today went ahead with $4 billion of retaliatory tariffs on US exports. Last month, the Iranians tested missile systems designed to shoot down American and Israeli jets. Although Biden has pledged to rejoin the deal preventing Iran from building nuclear weapons, he can't until Iran again complies with its terms. It may be easier said than done. Well, I'm sure it will be easier said than done. Uh, I'm sure that Iran feels that the United States doesn't have credibility. Uh, even Europe is going to be wary of the United States and where we're going to be headed. So there is very, very, very hard work ahead. Biden will need Senate approval for the Iran deal, as well as funding America's return to the World Health Organization. And he says he will restore the morale of the State Department and its disillusioned diplomats. Donald Trump has quite literally walled himself into this White House, failing to nurture some of America's most important relationships around the world. Joe Biden will strive to do the opposite, to build bridges, to restore trust, not to make America great again, when just making it predictable will be good enough. Jonathan Rugman, Channel 4 News, Washington. Well, joining me now is the journalist Evan Osnos, who's written a biography of the president today called Joe Biden, American Dreamer. He interviewed Mr. Biden during his term as vice president and more recently during his presidential run this year. Evan, welcome back to the program. Um, American Dreamer, that's the title of your book. How is he going to deal with the nightmare of a divided America? Well, he is inheriting a state of political, let's call it what it is, wreckage that I think no president would ask for. And yet he is also curiously suited to it. I mean, he has spent his life essentially straddling these political divides. I mean, to give you a couple of literal examples, when his son, Beau Biden, died in 2015, the only Republican senator who attended the funeral was Mitch McConnell. And Mitch McConnell and Joe Biden have a long history. In fact, Mitch McConnell once called the White House and said, is there anybody over there who knows how to make a deal? And Joe Biden was the one on the other end of that phone. So if anybody can figure out a way how to pick that lock, it's probably President-elect Joe Biden. And the fact that Mitch McConnell is so important, of course, is that he is still the Senate majority leader for the Republicans. And unless Joe Biden can do those deals for which he is famous for, he will be a lame duck president. It's true. If you go back and you look at the course of his career, one of the things I wanted to do in this book was say, let's get beyond the two or three surface you know, talking points that we know 
and look at what he's actually sort of believes about making government work. Back in 2009, when he came in as Barack, Barack Obama's vice president, one of the first things he did was that he was lobbying the Pennsylvania senator, a Republican named Arlen Specter, to change parties. He did it behind the scenes, and it worked, actually. Arlen Specter ended up changing parties. Joe Biden basically believes in an ideology, but his ideology is centrism. He thinks that if you can find a way to meet somebody on a field of potential cooperation, that we can cut across some of these lines that look to us so utterly intractable. Now, Jonathan Rodman was reporting about, you know, America's relationship with the world, as we know, is rather vexed. Do you see Joe Biden as an interventionist, or will he be someone who will further withdraw America's footprint from the rest of the world? I think what you'll see is a different kind of American presence. What you will not see is America first, which has been a kind of withdrawal, both strategically and morally, uh, withdrawing from the TPP, for instance, Trans-Pacific Partnership, or indeed, you know, casting doubt on the sanctity of things like NATO. Joe Biden fundamentally believes in the power of American alliances, but he's going to use it more carefully. He voted for the war in Iraq. He's learned that lesson. He regrets it. He talks about what is a more prudent application of American power and force abroad. He was against intervention in Libya. He was wary of the uh, raid to kill Osama bin Laden. He has, as he's gotten older, become, in fact, a, a, more, a more conservative user of uh, American arms. And I think that's what you're likely to see in office. Now, during the campaign, Donald Trump openly and repeatedly mocked Joe Biden, Sleepy Joe, as he called him, for his stammer, you know, supposing that he was too old and he was too senile, which, of course, is, you know, much of that is just complete nonsense. But Sleepy Joe woke up the opposition against Donald Trump. So I ask you this, any inference that he might only serve for one term, which is almost implied by the Democrats, is that true or is it false? Well, Joe Biden's been in politics a very long time, and he knows the moment he says he's only going to do one term, he becomes a lame duck. There's not a chance he's ever going to say it. He's going to say around probably the third year of his presidency, he'll start talking more seriously about whether or not he's going to run again. Look, the reality is he will be close to 82 years old at that point. He may not run for a second term, but that's why this vice president was so essential. He had to find somebody who would plausibly be able to take over on day one, and he found a senator with significant experience and credibility. So I, I wouldn't count him out for a second term, but of course it is, right. it would be an uphill, uphill climb.